Several hundred young people, mainly students at Tehran University, have taken over the embassy. The Iranians imprisoned them in a building somewhere on these grounds. One of the captives, blindfolded, was brought out into the open. He was turned to face reporters and cameramen and several hundred Iranian demonstrators outside the embassy's gates. Yankee, go home, they cried. This picture tells it all. U.S. citizens are under arrest after crossing the border into Iran from Iraq. The U.S. Department of State has asked Swiss diplomats to look into reports on Iranian TV that they have in fact arrested three Americans. They've been detained for illegal entry into Iran from Iraq's Kurdistan region. The American authorities are being extremely careful with what they're saying about what clearly happened uh, at the border. The three were in regular contact with their friend until 1.30 p.m. on Friday. That is when the last phone call was made, saying we are surrounded by the Iranian military. The way that our story was covered kind of led people to think that we just kind of dropped in to Kurdistan out of nowhere. But that's not what happened. We were living in Syria. During our year in Damascus in Syria, I was teaching Iraqi refugees. Some of them very recently fled from Iraq and sought refuge in Syria. I met Sarah. We were sharing a car ride across the country after Hurricane Katrina to help people rebuild their homes. Sarah was working on a lot of stuff in Latin America. She was working with the femicides in Juarez, bringing the mothers of the women who've disappeared to San Francisco to give talks about the situation and try to find a resolution to it. I had spent years in the Middle East, first learning Arabic and then working as a journalist. I was reporting uh, in Iraq, uh, in Palestine, in Yemen, countries around Syria. What Shane did, I think, was really unique and, and fearless. Um, he went to Iraq and he did sort of two reporting legs. One was he was embedded with a U.S. military unit that was training um, Iraqi soldiers. Um, these were the sort of soldiers that were supposed to take over from the U.S. coalition authority. And then he went into Baghdad unembedded and was with uh, families, victims of people who had been killed, um, assaulted, uh, wounded by these special forces. The U.S. was trained to take over security in the regions. Shane and I met because we were in the same community of activists. We're against war and occupation, and we saw each other at protests and political events. When we met, we instantly had an affinity that was really obvious to both of us. I had just come back from Chiapas, where I was doing solidarity work with the Zapatistas as an international peace observer. I remember thinking just what an amazing person he was. We sort of instantly became best friends. We just did everything together. And when we fell in love, from that point on, our lives were forever melded together. We really had like a, a big life in Syria. We had a strong community and a lot of really good friends. And in that time, uh, Josh came to visit us. I got this fellowship to teach on this undergraduate study abroad program, but it's not like a study abroad that goes to one place, it goes to several places. It went to Switzerland, India, China, and South Africa. I had been in communication with Shane and Sarah about um, visiting them in the Middle East before kind of heading back to the States. Part of my interest in going to the Middle East is like interest in history, political, but also personal history. My father's an Arab, born in the Arab world, but was estranged from it, and I was curious about it. Sarah had some time off work. She had kind of a work schedule. She had a week off vacation. So we wanted to take a trip somewhere. And Sean came to visit us, our other friend. We heard that Iraqi Kurdistan was a really beautiful, lush area, which it was. The Kurdish regional government of northern Iraq, they have information about tours and waterfalls and rivers. 
if somebody just types in the other Iraq, they'll see there's all this information out there about what a great destination it is. They emphasize that um, no American has ever been killed or kidnapped in northern Iraq in recent decades. So we decided on Iraq. We went in through Turkey on the north. We spent a few days uh, kind of seeing some sites. We went to some citadels, went to some museums. We went to this uh, Kurdish museum that was sort of acknowledging the atrocity of, of uh, Saddam's bombing of the Kurds there. The museum was actually a prison. We walked through this dark, terrifying place. They had recreated scenes of torture. I remember walking into this really small cell with just a little window, and I said, I, I couldn't make it in here for two hours. How could anyone live in a cell like this? That was two days before we went hiking. We all spent the first night in Salaminia together. That was the night of July 29th. We convened and had breakfast, and Sean had already heard about this place, Ahmed Awa. Everyone we talked to, taxi drivers, restaurant proprietors, people in the street, all recommended the same place. They all told us a small village named Ahmed Awa. We had a map that we had bought in Salaminia, and Ahmed Awa wasn't on the map. And so we asked again, is this, you know, it's not on the map? And they were like, yeah, you know, don't worry about it. There's, there's really no problem with this place. This is uh, Kurdistan, it's not like the rest of Iraq, and it's not, sounded good, you know? Seems safe. So Sarah, Josh, and I went, and Sean stayed behind. It wasn't, wasn't feeling very well. They took a taxi the evening of July 30th. We heard it was um, very common for people to spend the night at Ahmedawa when the plan was that Sean would meet us the next day at noon at the waterfall. There were hundreds of people camping out, Kurdish families. Um, it was kind of this kind of like festive atmosphere. We found a place to camp under a tree and we spent the night there. We woke up around sunrise and hiked up the valley. There were two different trails and one went behind the waterfall. And they pointed to that one, and they said, that's really good, you know, there's no problem. We hiked for many hours, probably four or five hours. Um, and it started to be around 11 o'clock. We took a break. We were near the top of this valley. I talked to them that morning, and they said they've had a beautiful time. They were continuing on, but they said they were going to be turning back soon. And I should come meet them. And I'd just stay on this one trail, and I would run into them as they were coming back. We're kind of deciding whether or not we want to continue a little ways just to go to the ridge and see, you know, the view or turn back. We were discussing in that moment that very topic, like, should we keep going or should we go back? When I glanced up to the ridge, the very top of the mountain. We saw uh, a man on the ridge above us. He was far enough away that I couldn't see his face. I couldn't see anything, any details about his uniform but I could see that he was holding a rifle. And he kind of waved to us, we waved to him, and uh, the first thing I thought was, um, this is a Kurdish soldier. He gestured with his arm and directed us to continue walking down the trail. He waved us over to the building ahead, and there was a man on top of it. He was on, on his radio and waved us over. So we stepped off the trail and walked further away from the waterfall. I greet him in Arabic and he doesn't know any Arabic, he doesn't respond in Arabic. He started to speak to us in a language that we didn't understand. And I assume that he's Kurdish. A lot of Iraqi Kurds don't speak Arabic, especially younger people. And then he said, Farsi. Do we hear you correctly? What do you mean Farsi? What about Farsi? In my mind, I heard uh, Faransi, which is French in Arabic, and I said, I don't speak French. And then Josh said, no, I think he's saying Farsi. And and we saw it on his pin, he had this Iranian flag, and we asked him, um, where, where is the border? Because Iraq is unmarked, there's no, no markings whatsoever. And he pointed to the ground where he was standing, he said, this is Iran, and then he pointed to the trail where we had just been hiking, and what 
we had stepped off of, and he said, Iraq. So we had, you know, across this, this border, this unmarked border. I got a second call that morning from Shane saying that they'd been arrested by Iranian officials. I made a brief call to a friend in the US and told him very quickly what happened. But before he could give me the phone number for the embassy, it, the line dropped. I jumped out of the bus, I jumped into a taxi, and went back into Soleimaniya. We came to a small shack uh, full of soldiers. The next hour or so was this confusion of trying to communicate with them and trying to understand, like, are we detained? Are we free to go? There was another point at which we stood up and tried to leave, and they stopped us again. We told them we, we didn't, we wanted to go back to Iraq, and uh, they were calling other people and uh, told us they were gonna have to go into a nearby city. And we refused. We said, no, we're not going to Iran. We don't wanna go to Iran. This ball got rolling where they needed to take us in, be questioned, and then it's like it climbed up this ladder very quickly. We locked arms and sat down and refused to move, and they had to physically tear us apart and physically lift us up and force us into their jeep. Very, very quickly became a political situation. I went to the gates of the police station. They sort of passed me along until about the third person I talked to is just taking notes as I'm speaking. And I was saying, you know, three Americans arrested by Iranian forces. And was, you know, I see his eyebrows shoot up. And I think, OK, finally, somebody's understood how serious this is. I was actually uh, working um, in my office and the phone rang. Typically, I don't pick up the phone when I'm with a client, but there's something that told me to pick up the phone, so I did. And I heard a voice on the end of the phone, hard to understand, and I almost hung up because I thought it was a salesperson. And then I heard Baghdad Embassy, and that stopped me. She said, we believe your son and friends have been become detained, and we believe it's by Iranian authorities. That's all we know. On July 31st, I got the phone call from U.S. Embassy in Baghdad saying that Josh is detained. I called my husband, who was in disbelief, as we all were. And then I called Alex in Sweden. And Alex had two more weeks just to stay in Sweden before he came home. And he said, Mom, I'm not staying my two more weeks. He was really, really upset. We spent nearly two months together in May and June. He left on the 5th of July. And he biked off to the bus station to catch the plane. And I just said, be safe. Could have been a bit safer. It was like the worst news of your life. You know, the very worst news you can imagine of your life. And then it became, a, you know, news. And then it was like that whole thing started happening. We asked uh, our Swiss partners who represent our interests in Iran to please uh, uh, pursue our inquiries to determine uh, the status of the three missing Americans. Nothing has been seen on the streets of Tehran like this since the revolution, right back in 1979. Thousands of young opposition protesters spilled out onto the streets in a spontaneous outburst of anger against what they said was a rigged election. The Green Movement protests in 2009 completely took the Iranian regime by surprise. They had spent three decades perfecting this autocratic control system, and it created an enormous amount of paranoia in the regime. And that paranoia really caused ripples across the Iranian political spectrum. Anything that hinted of sedition, anything that hinted of disruption, or most importantly, of outside influence, was immediately nipped in the bud.
and in the most violent way. So imagine in the midst of this intense paranoia, all of a sudden, these three kids show up in a place where they're not supposed to be. Uh, that, I think, caused the alarm bells in Iran to go off. Switzerland uh, is representing the U.S. interests in Iran and has been doing so for over 30 years. We are, in the absence of American uh, consular staff and diplomatic staff, we are the ones who have to take care of Americans in trouble. I was informed of this case on the 31st of, of July. Our first uh, few weeks uh, were spent trying just to get confirmation. Are they in Iran? Where are they? They didn't have a clue what to do with us. One spot to the next spot to the next spot. It's nighttime, and they're driving us somewhere. It's dark, and we're not really in a city anymore. And then we're sitting in the back seat, and I'm on the left, and I notice the guy in the passenger seat takes a gun out of the compartment, and he's kind of like playing with it, you know? He, this guy's got a gun. And I like whisper that to Shane up there, you know? looks back and then just like three times. So I'm sort of getting these visions of kind of like being walked out to a field, you know, just being shot dead. I said, well, we've got a problem. Josh is detained. I'm sure it will end quickly. I'm sure it's just some uh, unusual questioning that's going on. And I'm sure, you know, if there's any discussion, Josh will be home or he'll be at in 48 hours. When I first arrived, I was like, okay, we'll be out soon. And soon will be like a day or two. And when that didn't happen, I got put in a solitary cell. I'd count the tally marks on the wall because all other past prisoners would tally. And I'd like average them and then average them in a short term and long term and medium term and then be like, okay, well, I can't be a long term prisoner. 30 days. I'm out in 30 days for sure. When I heard a helicopter, I believed, I honest to God believed that that was an American diplomat, probably Hillary Clinton, coming to negotiate our release. But I had the wherewithal to say, if she came to do it, I would get free in three days. So if I'm not free in three days, I'm totally delusional. For several days, we didn't know. I mean, it, you know, Iran didn't admit that they even had them. So I have to say, my worry was, is he even alive? 30 days comes, the guard knocks on the door. They're like, okay, now you're going to the car. So get in the car, drive off, and then like look up, and it's just like another institutional looking building, and it's, it's Evan Prison. We knew they were in Evan Prison, but you know, that's one of the worst places in the world to be. I had horrible nightmares about what was going on there. I had terrible uh, images of what a being prison is like, because that is what it's like. I didn't have to make anything up. Iran is seriously considering putting these students, former students, on trial. If they were convicted under Iranian law, that crime is punishable by death. Now, this comes as the United States and Iran are deadlocked over uh, new negotiations over Iran's nuclear program. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton uh, just announced a call. From the beginning of the campaign, I decided that uh, revealing uh, my background, uh, being born in Iraq and raised in Israel, of course I was in the Israeli army, and uh, I decided that these facts should not be public. And uh, I tried in every event, even when the media came to my home, not to be there. It can hurt the campaign, and I will not take a chance to hurt my son. My friends that are very attuned to Israeli news, they said, well, if Shane got out and Josh has an affiliation with Israel, that would be a very tough struggle to get him out. Now we are in the time when Iran and Israel are at the worst relationship. And even though Josh has only American citizenship, they can use his Jewishness to get back to Israel or to the United States, and that's even more worrisome.
people often refer to time in prison as doing time. And there's a reason for that. Time is like a task. The most effort, all of your effort goes into making the time pass. I remember kind of kneeling on the floor, drifting off and being like, just kind of mind floating. It's like half awake state. I would brush my hair 300 times. I had this altar with all of these little things like um, a gum wrapper, a leaf, like anything that I was able to collect. And I would rearrange and clean my altar every day. I noticed I on the wall that the, um, the light that's coming through the barred window up, up there is moved, shifted a little bit. And I said, I was like, oh, well, hey, that was good. A cloud was on cloud nine, but time passed. And that's what I want to happen. I cleaned my cell, like, incessantly. I was always, like, scrubbing down the small metal sink that I had, and I did it, like, every day, and I became pretty obsessive about cleaning myself. <laughs> Mind, focus, let's do stuff, let's... And that was like Will, my Will, telling me that. And then my Will is also saying, like, time's passing. If it can pass in this dreamy state, that's good. I'm less here. I wouldn't let myself do the things that I really loved, like reading, until a certain time. And I'd force myself to wait until 6.30, and then I had 45 minutes of reading. So everything was like regimented and parsoned out because everything was so scarce. One of the first things we did was set up a chess board on the radiator. There's a lot of holes in the radiator and we stuck little pieces of cardboard in them that would signify the different pieces. We discovered time would disappear when we played and we would just be so in it, which is, that was the loveliest thing. And that was when we got books, we'd be in it. And if you're in something, you're okay. You get to the end of the book, and you're used to fear comes in of like, this book's gonna end, and I won't have anything else to be in and out of, just out of my head, you know, I'm in my head all day. There's not very many of us have full time jobs anymore. You know, it's like people have given up what, it, what they used to do in their lives to do this campaign. Having snatched these people and made a mistake, Iran has continued to dig in and retrench itself in ways that have made it harder uh, to admit that mistake. And so in order for there to be an end to this, it's sad to say, Iran has to have something to gain or something to lose. We had these protests. A friend of mine asked a, uh, a frame store to make, it was over 25 black frames, and they were used this, and we had over 100 people in Manhattan on 3rd Avenue at the Iranian Mission holding these. I was writing every day for like 10 months to Josh Shannon's hair in different envelopes, and it was 98 cents a letter to go to Iran. And so at different vigils, we had people just putting in dollar bills. These are the Bobcat raffles for Shane's dad. You know, we have a lot of financial issues we have to deal with, like the lawyer and stuff like that. Bobcat raffles, that's what I do for a living. I had to try to build something for Shane, Josh, and Sarah. Probably got about 60 hours in it. I hired my niece to go grab flyers and drive and passes them around all the way down to South Dakota. And I put my heart into it because I thought it was thought of the kids and it was hard to do. A lot of, a lot of tears in there. this whole thing started. Somebody said, well, won't your computer crash? I said, you're asking me? I don't know nothing about a computer. <laughs> I'll give him a big hug. And tell him a whisper in his ear, you are so grounded. <laughs>
we would see each other in the, the open air room for an hour a day. And I remember that when, when the hour would be over and we'd put our blindfolds on and we'd get taken back to our cells, the three of us would walk together. We had reached Sarah's hall. She would have to wait at the end of the hall for a guard to come and take her to her cell. I just have this like burned into my memory, these images of looking back at Sarah, seeing her standing there blindfolded often with tears running down her cheeks, and uh, I'm leaving her there. She's gonna go into her cell alone. She doesn't have anybody, and there's nothing I could do about it. There's so many letters that have come in. It's above 2,000 now. People have sent books. There's a stack of books there. I try and send one of those every week. A lot of people were writing to Shane, Sarah, and Josh in one letter, so I would just copy them and send them so they each got one. If they keep coming, I'm gonna keep sending them, whether they get them or not, because I want them to see how many people care. We've been promised phone calls all the time. We're told, according to Iranian law, you get one phone call per week. <laughs> We've had one phone call. I got a call from God. It was Josh. It was terrific five minutes. Yeah. I really, really very emotional. Yeah, oh, I'm yeah. so excited, yeah? He said, he said, <laughs> he sounds so strong. He really has two requests because he has limited time that when we write a letter, you write the first line when it was the last letter that you wrote. On the other hand, uh, he stressed the books. He said, this is, has been his best buddy. That's made my day. I'm <laughs> <laughs> so glad you were here. I listened to Dylan actually from high school on. And um, then the boys, Josh and uh, Alex, had listened to Dylan. And they both really, really took it to heart. We know he's a poet. Josh has quoted us certain songs from Dylan. He quoted, and I'm going to cry on this one, he said, I shall be released. And Alex and I were in a hotel room just doing some interviews in New York, and we heard this, and we knew, we knew what he was talking about. We needed no interpretation. Josh's message to me was, my heart is not weary. Alive and it's free. <sighs> I got nothing but affection for all those who stayed with me. Everybody moving if they ain't already there. Everybody got to move somewhere. The revolution of 1905 was suppressed by outsiders. The revolution of 1953 was suppressed by outsiders. One thing that the revolutionaries learned in 1979 is that the way to keep outsiders at bay is to take hostages. And indeed, part of why the embassy was taken in 1979 was precisely to keep the United States from entering and replacing the Shah back on his throne. Fast forward to 2009, I think there was a similar sentiment going on here, that with these three Americans being held in Evin prison, that at the very least, this would compel the United States to mind its own business. These three are hostages. That's, uh, they're not there because they broke any laws, because they did anything wrong. They're hostages. They were, they were taken for whatever reason by the people on the border, 
The first thing that's going to occur to people in Tehran, well, we've got a crisis on our hands here. What can, what will they pay us to turn these people back? And the reality was, the answer to that question was nothing. It's more costly to somebody to let them go than it is just to put it off day after day. And that's what's been going on. It has been 200 days since three American hikers were detained in Iran. Are you as optimistic today as you were then, Nora? Uh, oh, absolutely not. It's been 200 days. Today is 200 days. Right. We don't really know how these kids are doing now. We're really quite fearful about how they are. To mark the day of their arrest, their mothers protested outside the United Nations headquarters in New York. Mohammad Javad Larijani, head of Iran's Human Rights Council, told journalists in Geneva he had recommended that the three be allowed to receive family visits. On January 6, we applied for visas to go to Iran. And we understood it might take a month to get the visas to travel to Iran. We did not get the visas till May 12. They've been waiting for this day for nearly a year. The mothers of three detained American hikers began the long journey to Tehran on Tuesday to secure their children's release. Their decision to let the mothers be the main carriers of the messages was certainly very good because mothers are uh, the most legitimate uh, persons in the world to care for their children. It was a very special uh, event, I have to say. It took a long time to prepare. And when they finally came, they came completely wrapped up in black. Just landing in Tehran was very emotional for me because it was the same ground my son was on. The kids did not know they were coming to the Instagal Hotel to see their mothers. The moment that the door opened, that I saw Shane. I looked at him and we embraced and he started talking. I thought, this is still Shane. Shane's still Shane. I think our first hug was at least a half hour. All of, all of us were, we just didn't want to let them go. We had a total of 10 hours with them all together. So we had six hours one day and four hours the, the next. I was in a hurry to tell them everything. I was also wanted to hear everything Shane needed to tell us. Mostly they wanted news. They wanted information. They wanted to know what was going on. That first day I saw him was the, probably the best day of my life. The next day was the worst day of my life. As the time was getting later in the afternoon and we knew we were gonna have to leave, we're getting sick to our stomachs. So each mother is getting like, you know, your, your stomach sort of turning. It's irrational, it's crazy. You know, you're sitting there with your daughter and you're saying to yourself, this is my daughter. I have the right to take my daughter home. I'm thinking to myself, I gotta get her out of here. You know, maybe if I run down the hall with her, I can run down the staircase and they won't notice or some crazy stuff. All we can do is ask the Iranian government, please, 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 listen to us. We love our children so much. We want them out so badly. The kids went on one elevator. We went on another. They were departing from another exit. Seeing them be put on the elevator that last moment. We stayed there, all three of us mothers stayed there till the doors completely closed. You're really in a state of disbelief that you're leaving your son in Iran, halfway across the globe. No idea when you're gonna see or talk to him again. I had hope till the very last minute the wheels left the ground that maybe, maybe at the airport even they were gonna be there. When the wheels left the ground, I knew Shane was not coming home with me. Today marks one year my brother Shane, his fiance Sarah, and their friend Josh have been wrongfully detained in Iran. Shane is my brother. 
my support, my guidance, and my strength. I want him home. The situation for all three of them is horrible, of course, but it's a little worse for Sarah because she's in solitary. It's really difficult being alone. Um, Shane and Josh are in the room together, but I'm alone. Sarah's been in solitary for a year now. Uh, she's completely by herself 23 hours a day, and it's not stopping. This is having a very serious toll on, on the three of them. The isolation is, it's physically painful. It's like the feeling of loss, losing someone you love, but losing everything and everyone you love. It's like a physical pain that just like washes through your body for days and weeks. People have described prolonged solitary confinement as just like a slow march towards death. Sometimes it was just a threat that I was hanging on to. For Sarah Shord, another agonizing day of waiting. Her potential release announced on Thursday, canceled on Friday. Shord and her two colleagues have been in for 14 months. They still haven't been charged. And it looks like all of this boils down to this internal struggle that's going on between President Ahmadinejad and the other political opponents. This appeal is to the Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Saeed Ali Khomeini. This time of year is one of spiritual reflection and prayer. Please release our children and return them home to us. Nothing in the world would bring us greater joy. President Ahmadinejad had in fact himself per personally orchestrated Sarah Shord's release and then he was overruled by the judiciary. What does this say about him and, and his standing? It was seen as quite a humiliation for him. President Ahmadinejad was going to give a public presentation of her release. The foreign minister said she was going to be, be released and then the judiciary stepped in and said, not so fast, we're going to do it according to our time and our rules. Now, the head of the judiciary belongs to a family that's a main opponent, political opponent of Ahmadinejad. And I think a lot of this is wrapped up in that argument. You know, Ahmadinejad is heading to the United States next week or, uh, for, for these UN meetings. Uh, we talked a little bit at the beginning about the hiker uh, release being used as a political pawn. It runs on again, off again. Release of American hiker Chair Assured is on again. On Sunday, Iran's judiciary said that she can be released on half a million dollars bail after being held for more than a year. After several false starts and doubts up to the very last minute, she finally has her freedom. has just begun repaying the world for what it's done for me. I'm, I'm extremely grateful and I, I realize that there are many people in prison that don't have the kind of support that I've had and everyone deserves the same. Every innocent person in prison deserves the same support that I've received. What do you think happens to the other two hikers? Are they going to be released soon? We reach the Fatals at home in Philadelphia. We profoundly share in the joy of the Shord family and we want nothing more than, than to have that for, for our families as well. Tonight, Tehran's prosecutor offered little hope for the other two, saying they will now be tried for spying. Short is very aware they can also harm her two friends, who now appear headed for a court run by Iran's feared Revolutionary Guards. U.S. officials say, however, Diane, that Short will not be returning to Iran for any trial. I want to begin by again expressing my sincere thanks to the government and religious leaders of Iran for my compassionate release from detention. Shane and Josh do not deserve to be in prison one day longer than I was. This is not the time to celebrate. My disappointment in not sharing this with Shane and Josh was crushing. And I stand before you today only one third free. There's not this uh, look of, of joy, of celebration yet in your face. No, this is not what I thought it would be. You know, I thought this would be the end. And at this point, I don't know when the end is going to come. 
because this is for Shane and Josh, the tone should be, you know, serious and somber. Is this loud enough? Mm -hmm. I don't have a very loud voice. Frustrated is good. Not angry, but like frustrated. Is it better if I, is it better if I try to hold this low? Yeah. Sad is good. You know, it's kind of your choice if you want to come across more sad or more frustrated. Could you sit forward a little bit on the couch? Can everybody sit on the edge of the couch? After they go around and, and listen to your letters, um, then we all will get together in a group and chant, free all three. The movement that has led to my freedom will be the movement that leads to Shane and Josh's freedom. I've made a call out to people all over the world, all of our supporters, to make a banner, some kind of visual testimony to how outraged they are by Shane and Josh's continued detention. We're gonna hang banners that we have to help to spread awareness. It makes it really real, like what's, what's happening and how long it's been. There's so many supporters in the campaign that I've never met in prison. The only thing that gave me any hope and any strength is the knowledge that enough people in the world would care about what happened to us. Um, Shane was working as a journalist to the same end. Will you have some remarks, something yeah. just, yeah. you know, introduce yourself and just whatever. We're getting a lot of calls about what you were doing in the area. People were skeptical that you were just hiking. This is a, a day trip, basically, from Damascus, a bus trip to go to northern Iraq. We had absolutely no way to know that something this horrible was even a remote possibility. The second that I got off the plane into New York, Alex was there. He's just an incredibly important source of information, and he really helped me catch up to speed with the campaign. It's a, a grassroots operation. We're, we're working together as, as three families, and really it's kind of molding into one family at this point. Today's January 8th. 2011. Um, today I'm taking down the Christmas tree. I've been putting it off for as long as I can because I don't want to have to say goodbye to the holidays without Shane being here. Um, his presents are the only ones left under the tree and they're gonna have to be put up with the rest of his presents from previous Christmas and previous birthdays. And at least three people are dead after a day of anti-government protests in Egypt. Tense new beginnings for Tunisia. It's Arab neighbors nervous of how revolutionary feelings could spread. Just being here is a tremendous act of bravery because the government of this is a chain of uprising that several Arab countries, dubbed the Arab Awakening by analysts, has taken many by surprise. Get those bids up. It keeps us going. It keeps our campaign going. And it's going to bring Shane and Josh home. We have to make sure that no one connects Shane and Josh to the Arab uprising. So if Shane and Josh are associated with that, it could be dangerous for them. The Iranian government is able to detain people illegally, execute people. I mean, I met women when I was in prison, and one of them was, was a woman named Zahra Bahrami. We became friends, and every night we sang to each other, and she was eventually transferred because she was caught passing notes to me. A year later, she was executed. How many, how many fundraisers can we have? How many letters can we write? How many embassies can we circulate to? At this point, we've done it all many times over. If I say something that offends the Iranian government, is that, are they gonna take that out on Shane and Josh? If I say something that offends the US government, are they gonna stop whatever support they're giving us?
over in Iran this morning. This is an incredibly high stakes day for a pair of young Americans. These two young men were hiking along the Iran-Iraq border when they were arrested and accused of being American spies. They go on trial today and it could lead to a lifetime in prison or it could lead to their freedom. Today's session was held behind closed doors in Tehran's revolutionary court. Even the Swiss ambassador, America's only diplomatic representative in Iran, was thrown out. The stakes are immensely high. I mean, not only are those serious charges in Iran, which potentially carry a death sentence, but we've come to understand that the judge assigned is a very conservative judge, you know, what you might call a hanging judge here. I guess you might call him literally a hanging judge there, because my understanding is he actually has sentenced a number of people recently to execution. Uh, he's the judge who just handed down a 19-year sentence to a Canadian Iranian blogger. Shane and Josh actually got to spend some time, six hours in the same room with their lawyer. His name is Masoud Shafi. He's so brave and he believes so much in what he's doing. He believes so much in standing up for innocent people. The one thing that he's been promised all along was that he'd be able to meet with them. He's never met with them alone. He never had any time to prepare his case with them. He was promised that they would, he would get two hours alone with them and even that was taken away. So there's been absolutely no due process. Shafi has gotten very close to our family. I feel that. He has a personal interest in this and I think he's working above and beyond what a normal lawyer would for us because he feels personally connected. I worry about his safety and I think about Shane and Josh and I know they wouldn't want any harm to come to him or his family due to this situation. Do I want Shafi there for us? Absolutely, but I don't want him to risk his life or his freedom for us. And that's a real concern. I came to the Middle East about one week before I was arrested in Iran. And I was an educator in Oakland in 2005. I moved to Oregon. I was an educator in the environment. I had studied Arabic in the past and was working as a journalist focusing on American wrongdoings in the Middle East, uh, investigating uh, my government's actions in Iraq. And of all you know, the, the six hours of testimony, they, they chose this five minutes of Shane Bean talking about how his work is critical of the U.S. government. I don't know how you can charge someone of espionage of working with the U.S. government and also parade in front of the world the fact that they're very critical of the U.S.'s foreign policy in the Middle East. It seems like the trial was like three to six hours, and Shane and Josh were able to write their testimonies out, but not allowed, to, were they only allowed to speak to say that they don't accept the charges and that they're not guilty. We haven't heard anything back directly from the lawyer yet, but he said he was allowed to present his defense, and mm -hmm. they used me as an excuse for not having the trial be finished today, but they would have come up with any excuse. They said that there's gonna be one more court session in the next coming weeks. These three American suspects who have been captured, who were captured last year, certainly they were captured because the Iranian forces were uh, were vigilant. Iran has been surrounded by American and uh, NATO forces in Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Persian Gulf. We have this kind of uh, terrorist activities going on around our borders. That border region during the Bush administration was indeed used by American agents uh, to transfer arms and, and intelligence and other information to a Kurdish a rebel group uh, you know, based in Iran. Uh, the United States was arming and, and supporting them uh, as a means of destabilizing the uh, Iranian government. Because that border region had been used by US, uh, US agents in, in relatively recent history, the Iranian authorities seemed to believe they had some plausible grounds for claiming that uh, the hikers were, were part of this uh, American effort to uh, destabilize uh, their country. trial um, last week. The trial is, is a scary thing that 
Shane and Josh are really brave. They stood up and told their truth, and I hope that's a good sign. I'm Tom Morello, the Night Watchman. It's nice to see your beautiful faces tonight. Happy to come up here and play a show for Sarah, Josh, and Shane. I met Sarah tonight. And her heroic struggle to free her compadres is one that uh, I very much support. When the moms went over there, what Josh and Shane really wanted to know is, you know, who's, who's involved, like, who's doing what? And when they heard that Desmond Tutu spoke out for them, I think that, like, threw their world open. It was like, whoa, Desmond Tutu spoke out for us. And uh, Ba Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the UN, has, has also spoken out for them. And Josh, I mean, so overwhelmed and appreciative of what everybody's doing. It's not taken for granted. Boxing great Muhammad Ali, one of the most prominent U.S. Muslims, joined other U.S. Muslim leaders on Tuesday in an appeal to Iran's supreme leader to show mercy and free two Americans held on suspicion of espionage. The families of all the hikers told us the pain and suffering they had experienced. We wrote the, the letter to the Ayatollah asking for mercy and compassion and to let them go. It was important for him to represent these three individuals and let the Iranian government know that there were Muslims who believed in their innocence and wanted them free. Alex is phenomenal. This is a young man who dropped everything in his life, put it on hold, and every moment, every second, was spent trying to get his brother and his two friends out of that prison in Iran. We want them home. And we want them home as soon as possible. Today is Shane and Josh's second trial. Starts at 11.30 tonight. And I don't really know what to think right now. I'm just kind of trying to keep myself busy. And think good things for Shane and Josh. Shane and Josh's trial was supposed to be last night. And they didn't bring them from the prison. And I'm worried about Shane. It's been so long since anyone's seen him. I'm wondering if they're on a hunger strike. I'm wondering how they're being treated. Why they didn't bring them. one of these guards that was notorious for beating people. He's kind of like charging down at us. He start grabbing him and, and he just like goes berserk. At that point he just starts pushing me. I don't know what they're gonna do to him. But like, I know this guy beats people. And then the guard comes back upstairs that had taken Josh away. And he grabs me and throws me on the ground. And I just yell, where's Josh? The guard rushes back and has his fists up and tell him, hit me. He throws me, he just shoves me back against the wall and cracks my head against the back of the wall. At that point, I'm ready for, for him to just start beating me. At that moment, another guard stopped him, pulled him out of the cell and left. 
There was this man who was being beaten, and this guy was in really bad shape. He was destroyed. He, when he walked, he would kind of groan. He didn't sound human, honestly. And when people would come to his door, he would just scream in terror. I don't know what had been done to this man. At some point, a bunch of guards went to a cell, and they had cuffs. I don't know what they were doing, but Josh and I started pounding on the door, and the guards came, and we said to them, what is this, Guantanamo? Because in their minds, that was like the worst that could possibly be. It's Guantanamo, and how dare we compare their prison to Guantanamo, where dozens of people are being held without trial, many have been tortured. But it worked. It stopped. One thing the U.S. government did for us, one tangible thing, is to ask their allies to put pressure. Secretary Clinton was instrumental in terms of uh, working the phones, reaching out to other ministers of foreign affairs, presidents. Vice President Biden was leading on the Iraqis quite hard to try to be helpful. I got calls from the Iraqi president's son on a regular basis, but without Oman, none of it would have even gotten, gotten started. Why would Oman, one of the region's most low-key countries, be involved in such a high-stakes ordeal? Oman has had a steady relationship with Iran during the time of the Shah and post-revolution. Where most of his neighbors take an adversarial stance toward Iran, the Sultan is considered both progressive and pragmatic. Salam al Ismaili, who is the envoy to the Sultan of Oman, was one of the first people that was able to visit us. When I first saw Salem, it gave me a tremendous amount of hope because I felt like this is a way for Iran to save face, to, to release us to an Arab country. As soon as I was released from prison, Salem told me, Sarah, I need you on the outside to help me be the go-between between, between me and your government. Salem made multiple trips to Iran, often carrying very important uh, goodwill gestures from the U.S. side, and he would get rebuffed. Salem would get messages from the Iranian government and pass them on to me, and Cindy and Alex and I would go to D.C. and pass them on to our government. This is what the Iranian government wants. Sometimes it was something as little as a letter or uh, releasing a few Iranian students that had overstayed their visas and were in detention in the U.S. Everything that we presented was considered a non-starter. A journalist who I had actually traveled to Iran with some time before, Rhys Ehrlich, had gotten in touch with my assistant and said that uh, Sarah Short wanted to, to talk. And this is, of course, now a long time had passed because Sarah had been released by that time. And so it was at that point that, that I started trying to see if, I, if there was some way in which I could help. Fernando C. Leach and his um, colorful uh, personality. He had been the, the person who had put me together with uh, President Chavez the first time that I had intended to, to write about Venezuela and, and the president. That was always the first phone call that I made in, in anything related to Venezuela. I work in close collaboration with the State Department and the United States military in Haiti on a humanitarian mission. It was important to me to, to go to the State Department and to announce my intentions and also to ask the question of whether or not any involvement by Chavez would be stepping on the toes of things that they were doing to negotiate the release of, of Shane and Josh. In fact, I was encouraged very strongly to go and, and, and do it by the State Department. It was certainly in the interest of their citizens that anything that could be done should be done. Until we knew what President Chavez was going to say, both thought it best to announce the trip as, as related to Haiti. And, uh, and, and so it remained in, in terms of the public uh, perception of the trip. We gave him more of the facts of the case, and all indications are that Ahmadinejad did immediately agree to this, but he was facing great opposition and did not have the kind of support he once had had from the Supreme Leader. The mainstream U.S. media always presents the case that the face of power in Iran is Ahmadinejad where it's, it's, he is truly without power. It is, it is a country ruled by the supreme leader. I'm always thinking about, you know, what else can we do? What, what haven't we done? What countries haven't we tapped? It occurred to me, well, we just, we need to put more pressure on, on Oman and, and the Sultan. We had a phone call with Secretary Clinton, and 
I really pressed on her to get President Obama to make a phone call to the Sultan. They had President Obama write a letter to um, Sultan Qaboos. That letter prompted a letter from the Sultan to Ayatollah Khamenei. The Sultan made clear that you know this was no longer a minor favor that he was asking. Josh and Shane's continued detention was uh, going to have negative consequences on the relationship. Here we are at Aprovate Show Education Center, and this was the place that um, Josh taught for many, many years, and the place that um, he was centering himself out of when he was in Cottage Grove. This is the place that he worked, and he developed really close relationships with the land here and the local community and people here, and he loved this place. He loved this place. Josh first came here uh, as an intern in, in our, our sustainable living skills program, which eventually led to us hiring him as the coordinator of that program. He's very critical of all the terrible things and injustices in the world. His intentions are purely to go out and to help people, and it's just totally backwards that this great injustice has happened to him. Since Josh has been in prison, um, having Alex come out here has been really nice. It's sort of like the, it's like our connection to Josh. Got Shane's birthday coming up here on Wednesday. That one's going to be a tough one. How long were you planning on speaking for? Well, we can cut it as short as it needs to be. Yeah. I've felt more distance from my daughters. And I'm, I know they've felt that too. We've talked about this. This is probably the most painful thing for me. It's. Um, there's a separation. All of the like politics stuff, I hate so much. I start to worry what's gonna happen when this is over. What's gonna happen with our family and what's my relationship with my mom gonna be like? And with Sarah too. Our relationship is a lot different than it used to be. We have three very different families that have all been traumatized by this in different ways and have reacted to that trauma in really different ways. We have some folks here who don't get to have their family and friends with them. Their family and friends are halfway across the world. We just want to ask you guys that you tell everyone you know about Shane and Josh and that they're still in prison and write to politicians, have events, just really spread the word, because a lot of people don't realize they're still there almost two years later.
it was just me and there was no one else in the world that I cared about or cared about me, I never could have gotten through. So I think it really teaches you that you are the people that you love. These individuals have now been, in, been detained for two years and they still have not been convicted of a crime. International law requires that individuals who are charged with a crime and detained have access to their lawyer, have access to their family members, that their lawyer has access to the case files, and that they can actually meet so the lawyer can prepare their defense. And none of these things have happened. We heard in June, I think it was the third week in June, that Judge and Chain would be brought to trial on a very uh, propitious day of July 31st, the uh, second anniversary of when they were detained. The mistreatment that uh, Shane and Josh and also Sarah received while they were in detention uh, is unfortunately uh, very regular and uh, the order of the day when it comes to prisoners um, in Iran, um, especially prisoners who are charged often with political crimes. I know what it's like to lose my freedom. And I know what it's like to have two people that I love stuck inside prison. And honestly, some days, I don't know what's worse. Yeah, I'm going to bring this up for you guys. Okay. okay. I love you so much, and um, I just want you to know that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm good, I'm healthy, I'm strong, mentally, um, emotionally. I sound emotional now because it's amazing to hear your voice. Um, I love you so much, Sarah. You're incredible. Yeah. I get your letters and everything I hear about what you're doing with so love. that we're expecting to be the trial that ends all, all these other trials is gonna to happen tonight. So from about two o'clock tonight, we'll probably be in various stages of alert. Sarah definitely has a lot of, um, a lot of strength and a lot of courage and determination, but it's been, it's been difficult to watch her because she, she definitely has uh, PTSD and she has some, you know, she has symptoms which makes it difficult for her to enjoy her life. She's not happy. It's not like she's relaxed or happy or free, you know? So she's in a different kind of prison now than she was before. I was trying to ask myself that today, what my worst fear is, and <clears throat> just so you can just get it out and not, not hold it too close to yourself. Um, I guess my first, my worst fear is that they'll let Josh go and keep Shane. Iranian state news is reporting a verdict in their trial on charges of spying has been reached. But do we know what it is yet? The verdict is uh, uh, guilty, but. Uh, uh, the sentence is uh, about two years, which is the same time that they have served in behind bars right now. Uh, being years? convicted of spying is, uh, is, is, is actually punishable by death. So why does the attorney believe that a sentence of two years would be handed down oh by God. this court? Ambassador Loy just emailed, too, and she, I think said he's talking to her right now, but she just said the same thing, that there was trial, Shane and Josh, and... Shafi more or less defend to present a defense and um, the judge said that there will be a verdict within a week. I'm exhausted. I'm just waiting very impatiently to get the good news. Everybody's coping in their own way. Uh, but of course the collective anxiety is, is peaking right now. Whether they'll declare Shane and Josh free men, and I'm a, bit, I'm a bit skeptical, but um, we'll see. I, I'd love to be surprised.
The news is not good for the families of two American hikers arrested in Iran two years ago. Despite appeals from the U.S. government, Iranian state TV says the two have been sentenced to eight years in prison on charges that include espionage. The eight-year sentence, if confirmed, would set back hopes raised recently by Iran's foreign minister, who hinted the hikers' trial, which ended three weeks ago, could lead to their release. spoke to that president about a wide range of subjects, but this is the topic that's making the headlines. The president, in about a 45-minute interview, basically told us, in response to a question, that he has organized, he personally has organized, the release of the two remaining American hikers, talking about Josh Vital and Shane Bauer. He said that it's going to happen, in his words, in a couple of days, he said, as a humanitarian gesture. I think these two persons will be freed in a couple of days. In a couple of days? Yes, in, in, in a couple of days. Inshallah. Inshallah, they will be freed. Flying out, getting ready to see my brother after um, a long time. It's starting to happen. Starting? Yeah. I mean, it's already been on CNN, but they haven't, uh, they're not out, but okay. They said maybe an hour. Sarah said maybe three hours. Hi, Annie. <laughs> Starting to get excited here. Is it, it said, it just said on, uh, C on CNN, CNN, blow, anyway, like 30 minutes. Is oh, that true? I just got the alert. Oh, wait, wait a minute. It's on, hold on, I'll turn it on. Well, Ali, we've heard from a lawyer for those two detainees. Can you hear it? He's telling us now. My stomach feels pretty knotted up right now, too. I know that feeling. Yeah, it's in the stomach. <laughs> Who's here? Just count to two hours. Are you serious? Are you serious? Oh, oh my God! Oh, my God! Oh my God. <laughs> is now complete. Our uh, producer in Tehran confirms that diplomatic cars have entered the country. Well, show us. To, uh, to I feel Sean happy Howard, that it's going to happen, but I don't feel like it's done yet. I don't feel like it's happened yet. Well, at 5 o'clock, we have to be you there. Like... You better dress up, baby. <laughs> Shane and Josh, and they're sitting with uh, the Swiss ambassador. Josh, we are so we're ready to wrap our arms around you and Shane, man. We're here waiting for you. You're going to see us at the airport. I've got that big shawl that I think you've had in prison with you the whole time. <laughs> we're all here. Dad, Nicole, Shannon, Sarah, all the Fatals. We've been here for a week, Shane. <laughs> waiting for you. Hello, sunny boy. <laughs> Don't make me cry. I love you. I cannot wait. It has been a long time. <laughs> they are wheels up. They are on their way to Oman, where their families are known to be anxiously awaiting what is sure to be a very emotional reunion. I love you. I can't wait to see you. <laughs> Tell me to fly as fast as possible, <laughs> please. <laughs> Tell me that you'll open your eyes. Tell me.
This is the plane. This is Musket Oman. We are now seeing the plane carrying those two American hikers. We're right here behind the families of Josh Cabal and Shane Bauer. They are eagerly awaiting uh, this door of the plane to open. Right now we're seeing uh, we're seeing the security going up to the plane. Uh, everybody here, the mood, the anticipation, very high. Uh, the family members, all the family members are here, waving at the plane. And now the doors of the plane are open, and they're just waiting for the moment they've been waiting for for so long. After 781 days in prison, Shane and I are now free men. In prison, every time we complained about our conditions, the guards would immediately remind us of comparable conditions at Guantanamo Bay. They would remind us of CIA prisons in other parts of the world and the conditions that Iranians and others experience in prisons in the U.S. We do not believe that such human rights violations on the part of our government justify what has been done to us. Solitary confinement was the worst experience of all of our lives. It was clear to us from the very beginning that we were hostages. Hostage is the most accurate term because despite certain knowledge of our innocence, the Iranian government has tied our case to its political disputes with the U.S. We, uh, we just gotten out the night before and we got into Oman um, when it was dark. And uh, we swam in the sea, but then we were like up all night and we, three of us went on the roof of the American ambassador's house. And um, Sarah had this bottle of champagne and it was like, let's go up on the roof and celebrate. So we did and the sun was coming up and we like opened the champagne and the sun was like actually rising. The sky was like so blue. I just remember like the blueness and the bigness of the sky and the clouds. And there's like birds, like, flocks of birds really stand out in my mind. The first night in Oman was amazing. So it was like that second day after that beautiful night, it was like hectic and we're deciding when to leave and the families are all together like powwowing. It was the first time I'm kind of like powwowing with the families now. And I was like, oh yeah, I can handle this. And so I was like, I'm not really affected. This is awesome. I'm just like free and it's great. Then that night, it just like, oh, phew, caught up with me. I just started bawling. I just started bawling. And Alex got up immediately. I didn't know what to say. I was just like crying. I didn't even know why or what. It was just everything and all mixed up. And he said, you know, he's like, I don't know how to explain this. And he was like, you know, you don't, you don't have to. And I said, well, Alex, I said, you know, that was the exact thing I wanted to hear right now. I got like, tears running out of my face. It's just. Thank you.
in prison. I thought about Jenny a lot. We were sweethearts at like, you know, t at 12. Didn't, didn't last beyond middle school. And, but we were like, we were friends. We were just friends after that forever. And I remember when my mom visited, I was just like, Mom, do you know if Jenny is dating anybody right now? <laughs> that time with, you know, when the guy had the gun in the car and we weren't sure how that night would go. I think Sarah asked me, I was like, should I show again? I was like, yeah. I was just thinking about, you know, I want to have kids one day. We're gonna do a home birth. We filled up here. We've seen different practitioners, which is kind of nice because everyone has different ideas about um, how best to prepare for birth. Here we were, Jenny and I, having a child, doing July. Today is a very, very special day as we are celebrating uh, Joshua's first uh, baby son and my first grandchild. I decided, you know, when I was in solitary confinement, that I was going to propose to Sarah. I was like preparing myself to um, like be blindfolded eating lunch and like get down on one knee and propose to Sarah in front of Josh and the investigators. I made this uh, ring. I took some uh, cloth off of my uh, off of a towel. This like red string. He wove together a little ring. Yeah, yeah. I'm still wearing it. It's just red and white from string from his T-shirt. And this white string from my underwear. She's always said on TV that it was a shirt, but it was actually underwear. <laughs> so I made this ring, and then went out one day. I just took her hands and we were facing each other like sitting down and asked her if she would marry me and she got really nervous and <laughs> gave me a little speech in response <laughs> and said yes and, and that's how it happened. Shane, your love shows me for every second I fought for you, I would fight a million more. Before I decided to marry you, I'd already, already believed for years that you were the most important thing in the world to me. But then the time came when I understood that you were even more important to me than my own freedom. I don't know if I will ever dazzle the world with my love for you the way you have with your love for me. You've become a model to so many people of what it means to fight for who you love and to never ever quit. I will always stand by you. I will always fight for you when you need me to. When you fall, I'll always help you up. And with that, they are married. <laughs> My wish for you is that you have faith that without the times of struggle, there cannot be the strengthening of the bond that bonds you heart to heart and soul to soul. Jane, I couldn't have picked a better partner for you. You couldn't find anybody more special than her. She's just... <clears throat> Just awesome. <laughs> and so are you, Shane. <laughs> the last few years, I feel like we've seen your relationship grow a lot. But I think it's safe to say the majority of us can say that you haven't only strengthened your relationship. Because of you, a lot of our relationships with each other have strengthened so much. And it wasn't always easy the whole time, but... I feel like the outcome is this. Like, it's all these people here who really care about each other and really care about you. So, thank you for that. <laughs> we love you guys. Congratulations. Well, um, I have so much to say to you guys, but I talk to you guys a lot. And... <laughs> <laughs> but I um, just want to take a chance to reflect on... The, the day that I didn't go out to the courtyard and uh, Shane, Shane just wanted to go alone and I he came back and Josh, I, I have news for you. News, Grayman, tell me. 
And uh, he kind of knew what I was thinking, and it's like, uh, we're not getting free. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm getting married, getting married to Sarah. I just proposed, explained the whole thing. Asked me to be the best man, and uh, I'm been waiting for this moment for so long, so I'm just so happy it's happening. I'm so happy, happy that you've married, and we're all here to celebrate. I love this place. Uh, it's just so gorgeous. We're here with mountains hiking behind us. <laughs> and ocean, the ocean is in front of us. Love you guys. We probably crossed four feet or so into Iran, and we walked along their border. And what's clear is that we were in the wrong place. I remember complaining to a guard about my incarceration and my conditions. He looked at me, he gently patted me on the chest, and he said one word in Farsi, siyasi, political. And that just explained it all. focusing on the practice of prolonged solitary confinement in this country. People need to know who these people are. They need to change their idea of what a prisoner is. And that's why I'm writing a play. I think that that will change people's minds about our prison more than anything, is, is to actually change their idea of who a prisoner is. Having been a prisoner myself has made me really uh, want to look at our, our prison system. It's no secret that Iranian prison is, is terrible, you know? Um, but what's remarkable about, about our society is that we have 25% of the world's prison population. You know, we have more prisoners than any country in the world, and there's so many things going on, like like the solitary situation that, you know, we just really have no idea about. As soon as I kind of start getting into, you know, this the world of prisons here, which is a huge one, I really start seeing how many uh, issues there are. In some ways, I can tell so much of my story refracted through prison. And in some ways, I can tell I have nothing to do with prison. In some ways, it totally affected me. And in other ways, it hadn't at all. I am about to study uh, history. I went to prison because of the whole debacle at the border, but I stayed in prison for so long, really just because of the problems of history and the problems of American Iranian politics. I want to go to law school because I want to get involved in this uh, community rights that's going on in America where communities are looking to um, assert democracy on a local level. That's what brought me here in Cottage Grove and sort of being involved in this way before prison. So that's me telling my story as like, okay, well, prison, you know, didn't really affect me. I'm, I would have been doing this anyway. But then on the other hand, it did. And when I think about standing in front of the revolutionary courts and defending myself and seeing the implications of law and society in this way, yeah, did it.